day, we, uh, contrary to the contrary, was the calendar holiday of Easter. And so we did what we always do on the first day of the week. We memorialized, we honored the memorial of Christ's sacrifice and his victory. Sacrifice at the cross, his victory at the tomb, and what both of those mean to us today against our greatest enemy, against our greatest relational enemy, which is sin, and the consequence thereof of death, eternal separation from God, Jesus proved to be the victorious Lord of life. And as the resurrected and the exalted Lord, Jesus guarantees that victory for all who choose to continue trusting in him. What is that victory for us? Our sin to be atoned for by his shed blood and for us to enjoy that new life made possible by his resurrection to have these marvelous blessings, count your many blessings to have that. We must not only respond, and by that responding in faith, that's how easy God made it for us. We must not only respond in faith, we must remain faithful. Respond in faith, remain faithful. That means stay disciplined disciples. That reminds me, of course, of our mission based in Matthew 28. We are to evangelize and baptize and mutually mature one another. We are daily developing one another in the Lord. This is how we say it for everyone to easily say it together if you want to read it and say it with me. Equipping disciples to make new disciples. Amen. There is much responsibility and there is much blessing with being God's holy priesthood. Enjoy the focus this week in those uh, daily devotionals in this book that helps us get into the word and see his family as, we, as he sees it, as we truly are. We had a focus on this not too long ago. You get all week of it now. So as we think of God's ho being God's holy, sanctified priesthood, we're emphasizing staying faithful. And staying faithful, we're emphasizing this. Today's lesson is an extension, with the Easter holiday being the exception. It's an extension of a few thoughts we had two weeks ago, and it's worth our time. Staying faithful, because our salvation is at stake, and I care about salvation. I want my soul in everlasting right relationship with God. Never lower that shield or never take off that helmet. So, God's plan for us is to grow closer to Him every day. We talked about John 10.10, 10, the new abundant life He came for us to experience now with the promise of the future. We talked about Romans 8.28, that all things will work together for good. For what purpose? To become more like Christ, verse 29. We mentioned how the devil intends for all of his temptations for you to sin is to destroy your relationship with God. And yet, when we respond in faith to counter and to conquer those temptations, those even the devil's uh, fiery missiles that are intended to destroy you and give up the very thing that strengthens you, it's your faith. They can be served as a blessing when used properly. The devil knows that he cannot defeat God's armor. The devil knows that his missiles can't penetrate the armor of the Christian's strong shield of faith. That's why he will incessantly attack and attack in order to hopefully weaken you and cause you to just willingly give up, lower that shield. But in order to live, that is something we cannot do. We absolutely cannot. Why? Because eternal dwelling with God is to those who stay faithful to Christ in this temporal life. And that's why God provides us with the very same armor he used to prove victorious. I think about Satan's intent for us. God wants us to grow closer to him and, and be saved. But Satan wants us to share in his fate. Satan wants us to stay out of the kingdom. If he can't achieve that, he will attack those in the body to, to uh, drop out, just totally give it up, denounce it all. 
If he can't achieve that, he would settle for Christians to fizzle out. And I mean to digress to such a state that they might as well not even have a faith because they're not living it out. And the result would then be the same. You're susceptible to attack. You're unskilled in the word. And the consequence is not only your soul lost, but others whom you would have reached with living out the faith. So all this is why God provides us with the same armor that he used to be victorious over the devil. Think of it. He gives his baptized saints the same armor that he proved victorious over the devil with when he was in the flesh as the Messiah. He gives Christians the same weapons of the word of truth to wield that he used to defeat the father of all deceit, the devil. So when we respond in faith, we do well. When we stay trained in the word, we do well. And our study will emphasize those clear points of application, but getting there in our study will help us appreciate this even more. What is his armor? How do we suit up in it? Well, how do we use the weapons to defeat the devil like he did? How do we master their use? Okay, we've got the armor. Let's go through some training. Are you armed for victory? I love the accounts in the former covenant, the former covenant that Christ came to fulfill. I love the accounts in Scripture that show how many people of faith stood for righteousness and gained miraculous victory because of God's help and presence. I love that. In David's account, his battle with Goliath, when he comes on the scene, David was indeed armed, and we know the account well. In fact, that's why I'm referencing an outline two weeks ago. We did not have time then, but we do now to uh, focus on the details of that dramatized wording to get us uh, refreshed in our minds of some of the nuances and just appreciate what's going on here. I provided it for you this time as well on the outline, and let's just enjoy this reading uh, from someone else's work. I appreciate his work on this. Oh, it's on the screen now. David's victorious day. Here it is. The armies were lining up on opposing mountainsides. The vicious sounds of their war cries echoed through the intervening valley. The rattle of shields and the ringing of swords proclaimed the frenzy of energy pent, pent up in the warrior's the stomping of marching feet beat the rhythm of impending battle. One young man had traveled at his father's request to get word from his three older brothers fighting in the war. As he spoke to them in the ranks, a shocking thing occurred. A giant stepped out from the ranks of the Philistines into the valley. He was at least nine feet tall. His coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the spearhead weighed <laughs> nearly eight pounds itself. No doubt the restlessness of the waiting armies ceased. Silence fell, and Goliath's voice shattered it. I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. The army of Israel fled from this one giant of a man. Army was ready to face army, nervously I might add from the Israelites' perspective, but no individual was ready to face the giant. But the young man David was not afraid. He went to the king, which is Saul, and offered to fight. Despite Saul's protests, David insisted, turning down the aid of Saul's armor. Saul's armor. David stepped into the valley, seemingly alone. Goliath mocked him. Am I a dog that all of you have come to me with sticks? David responded with confidence. Had reached into a pouch grabbed a smooth stone he had retrieved from a nearby brook, placed it in a sling, and slung it directly 
into Goliath's head, temple. And the giant collapsed. David took the giant's own sword in that moment, cut off his head. This was reality back then. The news of this amazing victory spreading throughout the land, if this little boy or young man could do that to the giant, what could the rest of Israel's army do to the Philistines? The Philistine army fled and was routed. Because maybe they didn't take as much stock in their deal. Whoever wins will be the victors over the other, and the other will be the servants. They didn't want that. Makes me wonder about the perception of that whole event sometimes. Perhaps, perhaps, when we're at the uh, age of childhood, we've been familiar with this story since childhood. Maybe we've heard it all of our lives. We're so familiar with it that if I were to have asked you who killed Goliath, who defeated Goliath, you may give a truthful answer. You may say, David that's how you were taught. I mean, after all, David was determined to fight. David chose the sling. David selected the stones. David stepped out onto the battlefield. David swung the sling. David let loose the stones. David took his opportunity to take Goliath's own sword, because Israel didn't really have it except for one, the king, but he took that opportunity and used, wielded Goliath's own sword to finalize the victory. But as kids, we learn part of the story. Even as you grow into adulthood, you hear more gruesome details like one I earlier mentioned. But but there's other things we learn too, perspectives that we gain. Question, three questions. Who caused the victory? Who granted victory? the victory. Oh, I like this word. Who aided the victory? Who does inspired scripture say David? That's the fourth question. David, not just giving the glory to like, uh, I'll, I'll say thank you, God. No, no. Who does he give the credit for the victory? 1 Samuel 17, 46, David promised that Philistine with his own words, the Lord will deliver you into my hand And then specifically cries out in verse 47, for the battle is the Lord's. I love that song. Thank you. The battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. Wow. So David praised God for the victory of this battle because he knew the battle was hopeless without his aid. Are we going somewhere with this? Oh, of course we are, of course. But at this point, I want to reveal a a teaching throughout all of Scripture. It's a constant theme. So choose to, again, be blessed to get to a point we may already know where we're going with this enhanced study. I want to establish something here. David and Goliath in this account is great uh, left alone to teach us things like facing and overcoming your temptations and your sin, uh, fighting our good fight of faith with courage, being bold in the face of opposition, rising to the challenges of life. Those are all fine and appropriate, proper application. But the greater point, a greater point, is seen when placing this account in its scriptural and historical context, theologically. Israel had been a tribal nation, judges, were their rulers and their deliverers. And they led them to pivotal victories at times that were in unprecedented ways. And now Israel is following a king. Thursday morning's class, Steve mentioned this because it it lined up well to, to discuss this in that class also, that Israel wanted a king to be like the other nations. King Saul was, you know, selected. He once honored God, but he grew to ignore God. And he would ultimately lose the throne because of that. And David would eventually become king. We know all of that. But I want you to notice the place, the significant place that Scripture places David in a long line of people who God used to gain many victories for his chosen people, his holy priesthood. 
in miraculous ways. When I say miraculous by the presence of God's aid, it wouldn't have happened otherwise that way, okay? Numbers 27. In Numbers 27, when it was time to transition from Moses to the great leader Joshua now, why was he selected? Oh, yes, for many reasons. The Bible gives us a reason. In whom was the Spirit? God's Spirit. Things went well as long as Joshua led. But after he died, this is so, so sad and tragic. I don't understand this sometimes. Huh. How did the people, the people forget God? And hey, they fall into oppression. That's what happens in so many ways. But then they cry out for deliverance. Okay, God, we rejected you, but now we want you to deliver us. God rose up people. And this leads into Judges chapter 3. The first judge, Othniel who had great success because, Scripture says, the Spirit of the Lord was with and or upon him. And though not mentioned with every judge, the, the pattern builds assumption that that's why, if God selected the judge, he was with them. Their success is due to God's presence. Judges 6, the Midianites were now oppressing the land at this time, and Gideon we remember his account of 300 men, was successful because the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon, metaphorically speaking, figure of speech. And Judges 11, by now the Ammonite, uh, the Ammonites, yes, they were oppressing God's people and Jephthah. Jephthah defeated them because the Spirit of the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, was upon him. I'm seeing a pattern. Judges chapter 13, we can't ignore Samson. He sees something else. But his hair was a symbol of God's presence when he allowed it to be cut in a unique fashion, but still he allowed it. That severed the covenant and the spirit left him. So we knew the passing of time. His great feats, all of his great feats, actually, were accomplished because the Spirit of the Lord was with them and rushed upon him during the period of the judges. Israel eventually and incessantly asked for a king. God says, I won't stop you, but I will a couple times warn you, you will not like this. And yet, God is faithful to his covenant for our benefit, so he's going to be faithful to his people with that remnant preserved. And so God's chosen people, what does he do? God explains in 1 Samuel chapter 10 that his spirit rushed upon Saul, the first chosen king early on, placing Saul in a special line of people whom God was specially with. And again, we mentioned that as long as he chose to do God's will and honor him, things were good. His ego took the place of God's throne uh, seat on his heart, and that's not good. That's not good at all. And perhaps the saddest statement in Scripture that could ever be said about anyone is found right here, and it's addressed to Saul, pertaining to Saul, in 1 Samuel 16, 14. The Spirit of the Lord departed Saul, living without God and his blessing and his presence, the blessing of his presence. I do not want that. That is a dreadful thought to live without God. Perhaps this saddest statement is followed by the most joyous statement anyone could ever be said of, and in this case, referring to David, Keeping the historical context in place, chapter 16, verse 13. Samuel had anointed David, the son of Jesse, to be the next king. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. There was no miraculous manifestation at this anointing ceremony. But historically, this account of David and Goliath falls in place at chapter 17, of course, which comes right after chapter 16, demonstrates the truth of chapter 16, verse 13, which is David has entered a long line of people who now have special empowering presence of God. His spirit is with them. 
like Joshua, God's warrior, like Othniel, the first judge, like Gideon, who was clothed in the spirit, like Jephthah, who defeated numerous enemies, like Samson, who brought the house down, right? Like Saul, who, when he defeated Naash, the Ammonite, but now like David, who will walk onto the battlefield for Israel, being victorious against a superior, more greatly armed enemy and nation. Whew. The Philistine army, victory against them while holding a mere sling. How? I'll tell you how. Because David was armed with the Lord's Spirit, wielding the weapon of his wisdom and courage in faith. These men were armed with God's Spirit and were victorious. How does this apply to Christians today? The covenant of Christ that we are under for our own spiritual victory, which is defined today as faithfulness. We must become and we must remain suited in the Spirit of God. But how and what does that look like? Good question. Well, point two illustrates a few key ideas. We need to look at the Word for what it is. The Word is the very armor of God. Details coming. Ephesians 6. Go ahead and open there. We'll read it later. First of all, we must respond in faith. If we want the presence of God, if we want to enter His holy priesthood where He is with us, we must respond in faith to the gospel in the ceremony of baptism. Every Christian is then blessed with remission of sins, forgiveness, justification, reconciliation, and so much more. Every Christian, Acts 2.38, is sealed with the presence of the Lord's Spirit. 2 Corinthians 1.22, who will never leave us or forsake us, Hebrews 13.5, if we choose to remain faithful, Revelation 2.10, and so many more. Next, after that, you and I as brethren... Heed Paul's words to the brethren in Ephesus, chapter 3, verse 16. Paul said there, chapter 3, verse 16, you flip a page, I'll, I'll reference this. Paul said, they were being strengthened with power through the Spirit in their inner being. What's that power to do to make us more like Christ and stay faithful? Then reminds the brethren in Rome in chapter 8, verse 11, simply saying, The Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in them, and He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to their mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in each of them and each of us. This victory is to those who use God's armor to stay faithful. Paul had just also said, If Christ is in you, you're victorious over sin. Christians are in that long line of people who have his, his spirit and the promise of his current blessings for us today. But we still need that daily training. We still need that guidance in Christ to keep that mutual blessing of his abiding. I want him to be with us. So how does this work? I often think about that prayer in Ephesians 3. Go ahead and stay there. I want to reference verses 14 through 19, I guess. This is, this is good. Paul had just explained that the world can see the glory of God through his church, emphasized in class this morning. So he writes this prayer. Because of God's glory seen in the church, he prays for each member of the church. I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that, appreciate the reading earlier, that Christ, that is He, may dwell in your hearts through faith. Your faith is how He dwells. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend. Try to fathom with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, height, and depth and to know the love of Christ. Just try to, um, to understand this. You can't put it into words. Uh, even our experience is limited. God exceeds even that. It surpasses knowledge. But he wants this for you, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. 
What a prayer filled with the fullness of God. And I believe he meant every word of it. So if we have the essence of the Spirit, the seal of God, we need to increasingly live the God-honoring life by nourishing the Spirit to aid our walk. How do we do that? As I gaze towards the Scriptures. How do we do that? Here's how. Ephesians 3.17 says, Jesus Christ must dwell in our hearts by faith. That's the key word. So he governs all that we do because he's king. He's over the throne of our heart. Romans 10.17 talks about faith and says, Faith comes by hearing the word. Jesus is the incarnate word. He is truth, the word of truth. Hearing the word develops the faith. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I don't limit this to simply a syllogism, but I want to focus on this idea. If we long to be God-filled, we must work to be word-filled for the God-honoring life. This is how we nourish the Spirit within. With that in mind, now let's focus on Ephesians 6. I love this passage, beginning in verse 10. And I'll say amen to that too. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, there is victorious. Uh, here is a picture that was discussed, freely shared after being asked, from a conversation two weeks ago, I referenced Ephesians 6 two weeks ago. This is of one of the members with the arrow distinguishing because he's all in his gear. You may not recognize him. But he told me, of course, Michael Bullock, you know, he told me that when he is in that gear and when he's looking at his brethren, brothers in arms, also ready for battle, you know how he feels? I like this image I found online. He feels victorious. He feels uh, invincible invincible. Victory is granted. We are on a battlefield against very powerful and insurmountable enemies who can, I, I, if we step out unarmed with the Spirit and unskilled in the Word, we have no chance of surviving. So verse 14 comes back into play. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts or flaming missiles of the wicked one. Without that, we're just a setting die. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This is metaphorical speech. The word is more than the sword, but the sword of the Spirit is referred to in Hebrews 4.12 as the sword of the Spirit that he uses because it's so sharp and powerful. It can divide between the Spirit and the soul, showing the essence of our very heart, who we really are. But here is the key and point of encouragement. The whole panoply of God is rooted in the Word and revolves around the Word. Let's discuss the, the girding of our loins with the belt of truth. How do we secure any loose garment, draping garment, that would interfere with our survival tactics on the battlefield? With truth. And John 17, 17 says, sanctified by truth. We are sanctified in truth of His Word. So time in the Word prepares us to live the sanctified, God-filled life. 
What about this? Notice the pattern. Guard your heart, the wellspring of life, with the breastplate of righteousness. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16, Our training in righteousness is rooted in studying and living the Scripture. Proper study is learning it, living it. And in a world of evil and foolish rage, we must learn to shod our feet with the gospel of peace. A good shoe keeps traction, prevents slipping on as many terrains as possible so that you can stay firm-footed and maneuverable. Where do we learn about this peacekeeping traction gospel? Colossians 1.5. Colossians 1.5 says we need to spend time in the Word for that. And since God provides the shield of faith... I want to be protected from Satan's attacks. How do I learn to pick up and use, effectively use this shield to block the attacks from which they're coming and from what I see coming my way? How do I spot that? Well, Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes from hearing the word. So I need to know the word and can spot things with spiritual lenses that other people without faith just can't see. The knowledge of the word keeps us from attack. It minimizes many. And the helmet of salvation. How important is the head for life? How important is the head? Wear that helmet. This helmet preserves the soul. The soul. Salvation. The helmet. 2 Timothy 3 says that we mature into salvation from the Holy Scriptures. We mature into this salvation from the Holy Scriptures. So spending time in it is the way to keep wearing it. So we see the pattern, to be clothed in the Spirit. That's God's armor, the armor of God's Spirit. We must become skilled in the Scripture. Scripture is how we nourish the Spirit for a God-filled life. And in conclusion, are you armed with Christ? Are you ready for victory? Are you ready? We will be victorious in the word. We will have life by the word. I sure don't want it to judge us, as was mentioned earlier by the comments before Eleazar's prayer. I don't want the word to judge us uh, in that I don't want to be outside of Christ on that great day. I want the word to give me life. So are you clothed with the spirit, guided by his truth, matured in his presence? God's powerful presence, as we make connections to those uh, people in the former covenant days of old, God's manifested power is seen in his redeemed children as they live out the God-honoring life. They do that when they have the blessing of Christ. Are you in Christ? Do you have his presence with you? Are you living by the power of the word in faith? And if not, we can begin that life right now for all the blessings that are only in Christ. If you have not put on Christ in baptism, we will happily assist you with that right now or anytime, but right now is a time to put him on as we stand and as we sing.